Welcome everyone to this uh, panel. Truth is on um, common good and business. Yesterday perhaps it was a bit easy uh, to uh, reflect on common good with uh, persons like Cardinal Torrent because who common good is uh, a, a topic he's uh, used to deal with. Perhaps it's a bit less obvious and e even awkward to raise the issue with CEOs who we all think are only profit driven. And uh, it, it is actually the whole purpose of this session is uh, to see if uh, common good is just uh, a nice expression to, to discuss in uh, prestigious venues such as the Zermatt Summit. But when it gets to put it to be practical, I think uh, our red thread yesterday, uh, Rodrigo Jordan told us we have to be practical and not to evil markets. So we'll try to be as practical as possible with uh, our panel here who are top executives, but practitioners who face competition. And if they are here today, it's because they're also have another, perhaps, another style, another approach to, to management. Um, I won't uh, reintroduce you uh, once again, but you are from three different countries. You are from three different types of companies in three different sectors of the economy. But you all have in common the, the fact of perhaps making your business not only successful, but uh, meaningful. And we are also very fortunate here to have uh, Father Dermont uh, not only you are a, a Catholic priest in the UK, which in itself is perhaps unconventional, uh, but you, you are also, uh, before being a priest, you, had, you held a senior manager, you were a senior manager in, in the industry, you are a holder of, the, of an MBA, so you can talk to us from both a theological and, and business perspective, and I think the, 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 that's what the purpose of this uh, session is, is to try to, to, to see how uh, common good can also have its place in, in business. Because it's not just because you actually manage your business differently, then you're actually serving the common good. And I think that's what the, the, our discussion here will be about, is that it's not because you turn everything upside down that you are doing it the right way. So let me start with you, uh, Father Dermot, um, because um, you, c can you perhaps tell us how, why is it so, it's not really not obvious at all, why is the rule of Benedict, which goes centuries ago, I think at the fourth or fifth century. Uh, why is it, in, we're in 2012 in a world economy, why does it make sense to, to refer to it in, 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 in business? Uh, I think it's because in the rule of St. Benedict, which as you say is uh, 15 centuries old, there are components, elements, which might help us how we can or we can use perhaps to formulate our, a better understanding about what it is to promote the common good in an organization. Uh, if you remember, for those of you who've had a chance to read that uh, excellent little pamphlet about the common good, which was published by Ecophilos in 2010, we were reminded that those, there were three components, respect, for the human person, concern for, well sh concern for social well-being and the development of the community, and peace in a twofold sense, that of security and that of sustainability. And I think the reason that the rule of Benedict is crucial is because it's probably one of the first attempts in Western civilization, at any rate, to formulate a way of life, a way of living, uh, that promotes the common good. So that in spite of its antiquity, the rule of Benedict can point, or point perhaps not perhaps as clearly as we might like, but points to a solution. It's been described by some uh, management leaders as a manual for high performance coaching. Uh, but it's a manual not just for business leaders, but for anybody who is in the organization. It's for everybody, not just the CEO. And I think what I'd like to concentrate on are three elements which are, are important. Firstly, the principles of governance, secondly, the qualities of leadership, and thirdly, the daily timetable or framework for the day. 
So with your permission, I might say a little bit more about those. Is that okay? Well, one, I'll talk, uh, starting with the principles of government, uh, in our Benedictine way of life, we elect our own leader. Uh, that's not very common in the corporate world in the sense that the leader will be elected or chosen from amongst a small group of people by a powerful group of people such as the stakeholders or shareholders. But in our understanding of leadership, we have a co-responsibility to cooperate and support the leader that we choose. So it's not choosing a leader and say, get on with it. We are here to support you and cooperate. A second element is participative. Now, it's not democratic, but Benedict says, as soon as anything important is to be done in the community, let him call the whole community together and listen to what they say and then after hearing their advice, let him ponder it and follow what he judges to be the wiser course. So words like advice, ponder, judge, choose the wiser course, act with humility, these are key qualities of the person who is leading the community. And there's a third element as well, and that is delegation. But Benedict realises, as we all realise, that we cannot do everything ourselves, but is a focus on healing and restoring rather than punishing and expulsion. So that's the first element. The second element, would, uh, which was about corporate governance, if you like, the third, ele second element is the qualities of leadership. And that, that the leader is prepared to accept the shortcomings and failures of the people in his community. And he goes on to say that it's by remedying, remedying one's own faults that we can remedy the faults of others. And he reminds the leader that the role or his or her role, is not just temporal, but it's also spiritual. And that each person has to be treated according to their needs and temperament. He exhorts the superior to use argument, appeal, reproof, and vary with circumstances, threatening and coaxing by turns, stern as a taskmaster, yet devoted and tender as only a father can be. So a community leader trying to promote the common good would always adapt their leadership style to the character and intelligence of the individual. And for Benedict, the key qualities, the key virtues of leadership were discernment, wisdom, and prudence. And that means showing foresight and consideration. And at the end of his exhortation to the superior, he says, don't get excitable, don't be anxious, extreme, obstinate, jealous, or over suspicious. Because if you are, you'll never be at peace. And then finally, I just want to say a little bit about the balance, the daily timetable. There's a balance, a rhythm to living life in a monastery. I'm not quite sure how we could divide, de define work-life balance. But one thing I'd like to point out is the way in which the rule of Benedict understands the concept of leisure. For Benedict, there is always a contemplative dimension to leisure. When I read that uh, book, the, the little pamphlet uh, on the common good, 
reference was made to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and in fact several of the speakers have referred to uh, Aristotle in the last 24 hours. And as we know, Aristotle believed that the sovereign good of all human activity is happiness. But the point I want to make is this, that if you look closely at the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle also places great emphasis on contemplative activity. For Aristotle, contemplation was the highest form of intellectual activity. It has to be an integral part of life, and especially of our leisure. And we might reflect in our own very busy lives, where perhaps uh, our work-life balance is out of equilibrium, whether or not leisure has not lost its contemplative dimension. What the daily timetable, the rule of Benedict provides, is a way of ensuring that there is always a contemplative dimension in our daily life. So that when we come up against key decisions, crises in our organization, uh, when we're trying to formulate strategy for the future, uh, we do have the time to think and reflect and pray, if it's appropriate, about what the future strategy should be. So they're just some of the points I'd like to Thank you, make. Father Dermot. Uh, I think there's lots to, <laughs> to reflect on. You raised many qualities, and uh, uh, I would, I'm sure our CEOs here will have to will be, I don't know if you recognize yourself when you listen to Father Dermot, if you see yourself as an uh, abbe of a, of a community. But let me turn to you. Uh, Jean-Pascal Bobst, you are CEO of the Bobst Group, uh, which was founded by your predecessor and earlier ancestor, uh, Joseph Bobst, in uh, 1890. You are based in, in Lausanne. Uh, you are yourself a mechanical engineer. You're uh, in the packet industry, in the graphic arts, I would say in the, in the real economy. Uh, you manage over 5,000 people. Your uh, turnover is over 1.3 billion, uh, 1 .3 billion um, Swiss francs. Uh, and you are in 12 different countries. So when you listen to uh, the rule of Benedict, uh, and then you are sitting in your chair as the CEO, uh, you think that's practical? Or when you have to face competition, when you have to, when you see the Swiss francs going up, uh, you say, well, how do you actually bring this kind of, of social well-being that uh, Father Dermot was referring to, how do you bring, make the workplace of your company uh, a place of happiness, if possible? Um, I guess we should realize that in life, we cannot separate belief and business. Uh, we don't go on Sunday on the church and then the rest is something different and we have two separate <coughs> activities. Uh, God is helping us and asking us to live the Christian values every day, every time, every hour. And if we can, of course, and we have to apply these Christian values on every type of decision, family, churches, uh, and the question might be, what is the church? Uh, because it's not one once against the other one. Of, of course not. We are basically, we are creating, we are part, and we are the church. And uh, as a CEO, uh, you can imagine 2009, <clears throat> when the crisis uh, came, we lost more than 45% uh, of our turnover, so we moved from 1.6 to 1 billion turnover. Um, it was a drama, and you can read all the books, or you can have made every type of uh, uh, study. Uh, the rules were not applicable, common, or may, I will say human rules. On top of that, today, crisis is ongoing. We just listened yesterday, today, this morning. Uh, we know Europe is in a deep crisis, and it will continue, because as long as people, businessmen, continue to play the casino with money, they don't respect and apply Christian values, we will not be able to find the right solutions. Because benefit is not everything. And if, we, if you read the Bible, you see clearly that benefit, profit is good, 
but for a common good. And with, when I say common good, in fact, we have one God, and God is giving us all the means and the wealth and the resources to find solutions. But if we believe we can find solutions with our brain, we are lost. If we believe we find solutions with our heart, with love, with passion, on behalf and to manage the heritage we got from God, then I'm a believer that we will find the right solutions. And this is, in a nutshell, what we try to apply in our company. Uh, now, very difficult, because from one side, you cannot force employees to believe, and to say, you have to do this and that, because but you cannot. However, it's like with a family. I have four children, and I cannot oblige my kids to believe. I cannot tell them, you have to do this and that. I can ask, or I can pray for them, and I can coach them, and I can listen to them, and of course, I love them, uh, but they make their own decisions. And God gives us full freedom to say yes or no. But once you decide to give your life to God, then you have no choice but to obey to his values. And you can conduct your business with Christian values. In part of Jeremiah's uh, presentation, he, he mentioned the, the fact that you have to accept failure or shortcomings. And it's not always easy when you're a CEO, I suppose, to recognize sometimes perhaps you went the wrong way or another. Is, it, is there a way that in, in a company you, this can also be understood? And uh, another question is, how do you, um, when Father Jermatt said uh, uh, we must um, not only focus on punishing or expulsing uh, because your company went through a hard time, but healing and restoring. And uh, how do you in practically with your employees uh, put this into practice, for instance? Uh, to your first question, um, I think it's a question of humility. Uh, we know we make mistakes, and I compare again with the family. Uh, if with my son one day we had, a, let's say, a big argument, and of course I'm the father, I'm the CEO in, in the comp in, in, at home, so I have the power and I say now you have to do this and this and that. He was, today he's 18, but he was 10 years old at that time. And I said to, to, my, to my son, now it's over, I'm right, go to your uh, room and you think about. Then I never felt so stupid and useless and very, very um, disappointed, I would say. So I had to go back and say, Maxime, I, 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 please receive my apologies. I have to forgive. I had to come back and say, you know, yes, it was difficult for me, and this is why I went to this situation, but you have to understand. And since that time, since I was able to say, I'm weak, also, I'm a human being, but I love you so much. Now, we have to together to move and find solutions. And in business, yes, as a CEO, you have to make decisions, tough decisions, to lay off, to buy, to reduce, to whatever. Um, the main thing is, once you make a decision, I try to pray and get confirmation before making a decision, and more of three confirmation than only I believe I listen to God. And second, people recognize in the company that, so that if I make these mistakes, I'm ready to say, okay, I understand. So humility is very key and forgiveness is crucial to life. And then it doesn't mean it's a weakness. It, I think the contrary, it represents a strength and a value we try to convey to the company. Now to your second question, um, yes, still today, this year, we announced due to the crisis in Switzerland and the very high Swiss franc versus the euro and dollar, we lost more than 300 million turnover the last two years. 300 million out of 1.3 billion is huge. And due to exchange rate only, so not lots of market share, it's not a lot of loss of quality, it's just because casino worldwide. And um, yes, I had to say to my employees, we cannot survive anymore in Switzerland. We cannot, the biggest competitor and risk we have today is our own country, Switzerland. 
And this is like cancer. This is like something you cannot, you don't know how it will evolve. So in a true respectful manner, we have to say we have to reduce by 400 plus uh, jobs in Switzerland because we are losing for the last three years more than 30 to 40 million Swiss francs and it's, we cannot survive. So you cannot say, well, because you want goods for people, you lose, lose money and then you close the company because then you destroy value. On the contrary, what we very tangibly made is threefold. First, management for one year has reduced their salaries across the board to help a little bit, to share the pain. Second, we gave employees to other companies for three months, six months, eight months, because other businesses in Switzerland are doing well. So we rent, if you want, these resources for a couple of months until times are better. And for the last point is, yes, we had to reduce physically the headcount in Switzerland. So we offer jobs and we say to the people, we will find with you jobs in other companies uh, and voila. So it's a very painful decision. It's a very painful transition. But with respect, listening to people, um, I believe this is the best way we can bless them for their life and with their families. And if, and we did that also, if we see that we have very huge problems for some families, then twice we rehired the people because they were very in danger financially and, and, and physically. So we, have, we do have a social responsibility. But going through crisis in Europe, the next years will be very, very difficult, yes. Thank you, Jean-Pascal. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Stuart Drew. Uh, you are, as Christopher Wasserman said, uh, in the IT services. You are in a quoted Indian company, so we're, as I said, in a different sector of the economy, in a different type of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of company. Uh, you have, I think, uh, almost 90,000 employees uh, in 32 countries, and uh, I think uh, capital market is uh, 5 billion is that, uh, uh, pounds or, or dollars. <laughs> uh, you are uh, the executive vice president of uh, HCL Technologies and um, in charge of uh, Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa. Uh, you are um, uh, used to uh, cost reduction, offshore outsourcing, and, and working with India. So when you listen also to Father Dermot, do you think this is well good for books, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, not uh, the right way to, to run a, a proper company? How did you actually recognize some of, of the way your company is managed in what Father Dermot said? Yes. Uh, the interesting aspect is that working in India, it's probably more likely to take a Hindu base for the religious uh, uh, aspects of life, but I think Father would probably agree, as I'm a Catholic in, in, in the UK as well, is that all religions, I think, have fundamental beliefs that are more similar than different. Um, so the foundation is well recognized, whether it's Benedictine or others. But I slept well last night with my remote control pad next to my bed <laughs> because I've been struggling with the concept of the common good ever since I first met Christopher several months ago. And e yesterday I got even more confused. And when I looked at the fantastic art boards that are being drawn, it served to remind me how deeply complex and, and interrelated all these aspects are. Of, of we're trying to boil the ocean in the common good. But by the time the evening came, and the dancing in particular, it occurred to me that the first three movements of the dance last night were associated with childhood. And that that childhood is probably the same throughout the world. And it also occurred to me that there are remote communities around the world in harmony with their environments. If you take the Andaman Islands, none of the people and none of the animals that could walk died during the tsunami because they instinctively moved to higher ground without any warnings, no internet, no radio, no television. So it occurred to me, which is why I slept well last night, that the default human condition is the common good. We therefore set about developing <coughs> and growing to correct that ideal as we develop as a society or as a company or as individuals. And so we ended up with corrupt state, which we come to conferences like this, albeit too few of them, to try and rediscover what we already had. So that's why I slept well. Therefore, I committed to myself that I will press my restore default values button as often as I can as an individual um, whenever I feel I'm corrupting others 
or whether I feel I'm being corrupted in the ideal of the common good. The reason I use that preamble is because it occurred to me that in 2005, our company had become a corrupt ideal of the common good. We were large, we were growing, we were fat and happy, but we weren't growing as fast as competitors. We had a command and control structure where the CEO had 82 direct reports. Um, people lived in fear for their jobs. They expected only to progress with seniority and age and experience, not in any value of meritocracy. And it occurs to me that we reset the restore default values button in 2005. That's when he's turned down. everything upside down. Thank you. So we got there. <laughs> Forgive the uh, digression. <coughs> so what we asked ourselves was, what are we in business to do? And the answer was to deliver differentiated values to our customers. That was easy. So we then said, who delivers that differentiated value? And the answer was the employees. Note, not management. And not head office functions. So we said, well, if it is true that the employees deliver the differentiated value to customers, what is the role of management and what we call enabling functions? And the answer was to enthuse, encourage and empower the employees to deliver that value. The next problem became, well, how do you invite employees to trust you when you've come from a command and control environment in the way I described? Very often, strategies in organisations fail because of the trust of the employees and middle management is not present. You cannot demand trust, you cannot buy trust. So we said to ourselves, what is the condition of trust that allows us to invite that? And we, kept, we came up with the answer that the idea was to push the envelope of transparency. So that's when we started to practically deliver things. So we said, what do we mean? How will the employees trust us in this new venture that we are serious about empowering, encouraging and enthusing them? So one of the things we said, well, we need to start with management. We did a 360-degree feedback. And I'm sure a lot of organizations around the world do 360-degree feedback. It's another way of turning upside down. Exactly. I then ask any company who says we do it, do you publish the managers and the board and the CEO's 360-degree on the internal web? I have never found a company apart from ours who says yes to that. So we're making the evaluation of the board right down to management layers visible to the employees. The second thing we said to ourselves was uh, the employees have a lot of concerns about working for our company as they do for any company. How do we allow them to express that? So we created a service desk concept where any employee can raise a trouble ticket on any part of the company. The manager has to process the trouble ticket and the only person who can tr close the trouble ticket is the employee, not the manager. And the manager is measured on his ability to meet SLA, service level agreements, about the time it takes to resolve those issues. Right? We get 25,000 of those a month. If you saw any of them, you would never work for HCL. <laughs> but 95% 25, of those... 25,000 trouble tickets. Trouble tickets. So that's about, if you think about it, it's about one every three months for every employee. And 95% of those are resolved within SLA. We, s we nearly shut the thing down because when we started it, there were so many horrible things being said that we said, this is not good. The staff said to us, don't shut it down. A, because we're saying this outside anyway, through our own social networking of Facebook or whatever. Secondly, we don't always agree with the person who raises the problem. So there is a self-healing mechanism among the employees about, I never experienced that issue. I don't have that problem. So these are two things that we practically did to try and invite this trust and transparency. The final thing in terms of, of what happens is you remember the original goal was to deliver differentiated value to customers. So we then created a portal by which the boys and girls can, who work with customers put in their ideas of value add. That can be any type of value add, financial or non-financial. They get scrutinized internally in the company and then they get shared with a customer. Where they're agreed with the customer, they are physically signed off and banked in the portal. So we can have a conversation with a customer every month, every quarter, every year on the value we have delivered in excess of contract commitment that has been signed off by them that had its seed with the employees. I have a, um, a question for you, Stuart. If employees are first and customers second, I think of the title of the book of your CEO, 
uh, where does actually the CEO stand? Is he third, fourth, or <laughs> fifth? What does the CEO stand? <laughs> if customers are sec uh, employees are first, customers second, where is the CEO within third, fourth, or fifth? Well, the, the, he, the CEO is interesting character, and he is one of the leaders that I think we would all like to see more of, because he actually said that his job, his next job after he, he we were on the five-year journey, and the book got published in 2010, and it is a Harvard case study and a London Business School case study, so the, the story and the metrics are in the public domain. The books, by the way, are both in English and French in the bookstore outside. But he said that his job was to destroy the office of the CEO. Because the concept was that all the time that I've grown up in management outside of HCL is the idea is the more senior you are in the company, the more you know and the more you're able to solve other people's problems. In the world, in the pace at which it's moving, that's not true. All the answers are down there. So the CEO is very often the least well-informed of any person in an organization because any issues have been tried to be solved before they get to him or her. Well, thank you. This is more than turning upside down. If, if you destroy the CEO's uh, offices, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there will be uh, reactions. Uh, but uh, before I'd like to turn to my compatriot, uh, Frédéric uh, de Narp. You, you are not an American in Paris. You are a, a Frenchman in New York. Uh, living there for seven years after a successful career that started in Japan when you were 21, and then uh, with a sh short time in Haiti, and then back in, uh, I think, in Italy, Switzerland, uh, uh, Greece, and uh, in the USA. And uh, you are now CEO of uh, Harry Winston, the luxury brand, uh, specializing in diamonds, and uh, you joined this company after a, a long uh, first career um, with uh, Cartier. Uh, you uh, have 700 employees, and I would say you are also in the, uh, with being in the luxury sector, and also in the in the so-called real economy. Um, when, when you actually uh, listen also to to Father Dermot, he was you no know, talking about the the work-life balance and how you actually get. Uh, and you, as a CEO, I understand you are very busy, but I know you you mentioned you are also have uh, seven children. So how do you actually get this balance right? <laughs> Well, first, the, the, the thing is, um, I was given the chance to, uh, to work for the last 22 years in the, in the luxury world, which appears to be the ultimate expression of materialism and consumerism. And, and, uh, and it is a fact that um, with the last uh, 30 years, we've, vis we, we've been the testimony of, uh, of the deconstruction of the traditional values. And with that, the open doors to more, um, to more yes, materialism. And we are this ultimate expression. And I was raised uh, to myself, why? Why am I given to be in this world? that I love truly. And, and, and the answer has always been to be, to be the bridge, um, this image of a bridge, a bridge between the, the richest of the world and, and the poorest in a way, and, and try to, to be the bridge with, uh, with personal very strong convictions and management convictions uh, that are the, the quest for common goods that are, uh, keep me alive and, and, and happy every morning, the, 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 the three main elements being the fact of the, that we are co-creators, we are in charge of uh, one, only one is in charge, but we are all co in charge of the creation every day. So what am I going to do when I save myself every morning? What am I going to do today to, um, to co-create? To, to co um, the other thing is that we are all connected and interdependent, and, and that human beings are, are realizing themselves through giving, um, through, the, through the gift. And uh, so I could have the chance, uh, working for Cartier first uh, for 19 years, to try to make, some, to, to make some campaigns and to try to identify the values embedded in the company that we could turn to make it uh, the vision, the, 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 the center uh, of the business model of the company. So I can share with you um, um, uh, the love campaign we created uh, around that and then a, a little experience on High Winston as well. Um, Cartier had a, had, had a bracelet uh, and a bracelet called the love bracelet and to relaunch the love bracelet, the, the bracelet was called love bracelet. Um, two, two pieces of gold that you screw on your, on your wrist and you need somebody to screw it on your wrist, you cannot do it by yourself. So symbol of love, right. So I turned it and I said, well, love is, is about commitment. And we, well, why don't we celebrate love between not two human beings, but love for a cause as well. And living in America, which is a deep, generous country, and working uh, in the is world. quite uh, something well developed. Yeah. Yes, and, and where also the celebrities and, and Hollywood is so important. Um, we said, and, and, and the, the vision of having um, these elements, you know, you have love bracelets, you have celebrities of Hollywood, with oftentimes a perception of being beautiful but not so, so smart, which is and not committed and superficial, and, and, and the rich people buying big luxury goods and that's it. And that's it. So, 
Um, and how can we put that together? So we invented a campaign, uh, we, um, the love campaign, where we would celebrate the love, the commitment and passion for a cause of human beings. And we went to pick up some celebrities in Hollywood, create on their name a love bracelet. To the celebrity, we would not give any penny, but 100% of the, of the, the fund raised from this bracelet would go to a cause. And was the love... Which cause was it? Uh, Sorry? Which cause was the it? The cause was, well, uh, on three, during three years, we, we've chosen eight causes different uh, every year, so 24 causes for during these last three years, and, and, and we, we could raise millions of dollars for different charitable causes on the name of love and commitment and create the Love Day. And, and the Love Day was, was uh, perceived inside the company as something utopical and, and a dream, and they say, well, forget about that and everything. And my manager said, I, I was so pushy about that. So they said, well, do it in America if you believe, but don't bother us with your project. So we did in America create the Love Day. And we even sponsored on the name of love because that was communicating about the, love, the, the values of human beings. And we, we, we promoted and, and sponsored a project, for example, called Monument to Smile, where we projected on the 40 top floors of the Rockefeller Center, 200 photos, three meters high, of people with a big smile. We call it Monument to Smile on the name of love. We could cultivate the, 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 the values of love. This campaign was tremendously successful, but has brought uh, me to a point of rupture, of a breaking point to the, uh, because we were not, not all aligned. Uh, but the positive thing was that- a, a personal. Uh, yes, personal, uh, because it was so strong as a project, it was then voted at the Love Day worldwide, all the subsidiaries developed it, and it was pretty positive for the company, for the shareholders, for the employees, for the clients and everybody, but the shareholders at the end of the day, we were kind of not, not disaligned, kind of disaligned. And, and after 19 years working for this company, pushing the envelope and doing great projects, I was given the chance to, um, to be offered a job at Harry Winston. And, and, and this, this, this is where I really uh, was a defining point of my career because that was two years and a half ago and I was given the chance to enter a diamond company, uh, leaving the largest jewelry company, Cartier, but entering uh, the most exclusive one, High Winston. And, and the thing is, we could turn and put generosity really at the center of the business model at that point with High Winston and, and, and really um, changing all the paradigm, all the, uh, the, the strategy of the brand, the vision of the brand, starting from the fact that if clients buy diamonds to celebrate a meaningful moment of their lives, then everything we have to, for, to offer is about meaningfulness. Meaningful products promoting the craftsmanship of, of human beings, the quality of our products, a meaningful team, so all the meaningfulness of the team would be around um, uh, giving back, uh, giving some time for charitable organizations, about knowledge, about passion, about working as a team uh, with integrity. And the meaningful brand would be a brand that would, uh, would give back. And we would inspire ourselves from the Hope Diamond uh, that was given by High Winston uh, 50 years ago to a museum is a, is a stone in the window, but probably the most expensive stone and, and rarest gem on earth ever found, 45 carat blue diamond found 350 years ago that belonged to Louis XIV, Marie Antoinette, and so on and so forth, but given by Harry Winston to a Smithsonian Museum to share his passion for gems. And we put that at the center of the creation of a Harry Winston Hope Foundation to give back. So the meaningfulness at all levels was found and I'm happy to report that doing good is good for business. The business is turned around. We increased the sales by 85% in 24 months. And, and the fact is that people, employees, feel so much more engaged. And the engagement of people is, 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 is crucial because we give them to the possibility to, to help these um, charitable organizations and, and to, f to find a sense, a meaningful sense That's in their job. So it's not just life. a paid job, but a a job that also that pays, uh, hopefully, but also that uh, it is uh, meaningful. It's interesting you raised the, the, the issue of, a, of a, well, the point of smiling because yesterday in one of the uh, workshops we were in, uh, when we were playing with those remote controls, one of uh, the people wrote, you know, smiling as uh, something we could do for, I don't know if it was for this for th 30 years or for eternity, but uh, it's, it's something that is uh, <laughs> very, very uh, important. But let, let me just uh, finish with my first question. Like actually, how do you make your work-life balance uh, with your own family. <laughs> well, this is the, 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 this is the stretch, I think, of any, any CEOs or any entrepreneurs that are working, working out there, I think, is you never find the right solution. You try to balance it. Uh, prayer life is very, very intense. And, uh, and, uh, and, and in my personal life, the, um, the, 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 the most important strength comes from the Holy Spirit. Um, it is, uh, you know, High Winston used to have always one or two diamonds in his pocket he would play with, and I have a miraculous medallion in my pocket, with it, which are my, 
my uh, recall to, uh, to pray and try to have an intense prayer life. But the Holy Spirit is, is, um, is, uh, is the one uh, that helps me uh, take the main decisions and, and find discernment in every single situation, I will tell you. Thank you. We, before I open the questions to, to the floor with the remaining time, um, since you all uh, uh, heard, listen to each other, uh, I'm sure you something you may want to react on. I was wondering, uh, Jean-Pascal, when you heard uh, uh, Stuart Drew talking about uh, trouble tickets, is it something that you would introduce in your company, uh, the employees able to um, uh, 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 and bring up to middle management the trouble tickets, or, they, or you have something uh, comparable? <laughs> Yeah, maybe two, two comments on, on that. First of all, uh, as God came here, Jesus came on the earth at the service of people. Uh, every manager and therefore CEO is at the service of people and employees. So this upside down of pyramid, when you create a hierarchy, you always end up with the CEO on top. On the, on, but in fact, you do nothing. And of course, uh, yes, you, I can rent my office if you want. I can give it to you. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, anyway, we are more on the airplane than in the office. But uh, the only thing you do as a CEO is to appreciate, evaluate, love people, and give these extra dimensions, this value. And the culture of the company has to start from the top or from the parents, if you look at the family. And this is the same. That's why I make the link between family and company, because parents, we know, we have almost no influence on our children. We are just here to listen to them, and we hope and we pray that they grow, and you give them all means, tools, support for them to, to be successful. So that's one point. And of course, for these issue tickets, certainly something we will think about, because it's a concern. How do you get, you are in 13 plus countries worldwide, you have a limited time frame, uh, you manage 30 more cultures, uh, relationship with customers, and how do you make sure that you employ every interface with the customer will convey the same culture, the right attitude, the right behavior of compassion, of forgiveness, of, of excellence, because we need to achieve excellence. And certainly, it's a, a good learning, and I will take that and, and, and try, and maybe come back to you, Stuart, to understand how you manage it, because it, we, we need to create this openness and trust. And you write to a trust you cannot mm -hmm. declare. You have to build. You have to, to, to you, yeah. You have to transpire that. You, it, it, it's a lot of energy and passion to create this trust. Frederic, when you hear uh, employees first, customers second, you think that's just pure provocative and even populist, or it's something that makes sense? No, I think it's. Um, it's, it's a whole thing, it has to be, it's, it's a question of balance. If, it, it's a question of balance. You cannot put the employees behind the, 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 if we are a publicly traded company and we are here to create value to the shareholders. If we are not creating value to the shareholders, we're not doing our job. Uh, so, but there are ways to create the, the value to the shareholders, benefiting clients, benefiting employees, um, and in, in a well-balanced way. Uh, well, one way, I mean, I, I try to, to try to convey the messages and try to be close to the employees and get as well the truth uh, that is coming from the ground. I do a little thing that is, uh, might look stupid, but to me has, has brought a lot, is um, make a breakfast, I pick and choose uh, um, every month uh, or every two weeks, uh, eight people from the company, seven or eight people from every level, a doorman, a bodyguard, a, a diamond grader, et cetera, all sorts of people or vice president of the company. And I put them in the room, and, and it's eight, you know, it's a, an hour to discuss of anything. There's no cameras, everything they want to discuss, and across the board. So they can challenge the vision, they can challenge their, their, their conflicts, everyday conflicts, and everything. And this is my best source of, of inspiration to run the company, to really understand what's, what's deeply rooted in, into the company and what are the conflicts and problems. And it's also a way to be close to the employees because it's a meaningful moment with them, a moment of faith. Well, thank you for being so practical in your answers. Uh, Stuart, I don't know if you had wanted to react to some of the, of the things that yes, were said here before I, we pass on to the questions. I like the idea of the love day very much. <laughs> uh, that concept, I think, is very sound from a business perspective as well. And uh, in terms of work-life balance, we all struggle. Um, the internet, the mobile phone uh, makes life more difficult. Uh, so I fixed that problem by inviting my wife to this conference. Uh, 
Um, but seriously, it is a, it is a challenge, and, and we, we have to watch it because the, there are all the temptations, if you like, to make the workday as long as you'd like to be, particularly in a globalised business. Um, so that's certainly something we need to look at. Thank you. We, I think we have uh, ten, roughly 10 minutes to, to go to allow for some questions. Uh, and I'm sure uh, if you could raise your hands and uh, tell sh uh, quickly who you are and please also make questions short because the more, the, the shorter the questions, the more we can uh, have answers. <laughs> so please, uh, Madam. Right. Thank you. Um, my name is Leslie Johnston and I work for Kofra Holding, uh, which is actually one of the sponsors of this event through the foundation. And my question is more around the role of corporate philanthropy and I'd be very curious to hear how you see corporate philanthropy fitting into your more holistic approach uh, for each of your companies. What do you think of Michael Porter's shared value uh, approach, for example? And do you think that corporate philanthropy should be separate from how a company operates or very much ingrained in the day-to-day -day, uh, business or services that you provide? Thank you. Uh, perhaps, uh, Frédéric, you would like to answer these questions, as you, uh, I think you've done philanthropy yourself and Stuart as well. Um, I, I, I'm lucky enough to be part of a committee called the Com CECP Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy in New York, which is a bunch of uh, 100 CEOs brainstorming twice a year on how to make our corporation more philanthropic. And no, it should not be separate, it should be part of it. I mean. Uh, the more you go, the exciting thing is that with what the, this confused world, this volatile world, is bringing a new generation of leaders who are really not about only making money. They surely want a good salary, but they really want meaningful context, meaningful environments, meaningful enterprises. And you see employees coming from Harvard, from, from the best schools in the world. They come to you and they challenge you at the, the, the moment of the interview and they say, well, can you tell me what you do for the, to give back? What is the, the plan for the company and everything? And they don't hesitate. And if you don't have a fair um, and balanced answer, um, they'll say, okay, I, I won't join you. And the more you go, you see the banks, the bigger entities of the world, they have to, be, to give back. Even if you don't have it in your heart, you have to, to get there because the new generations, I mean, our generations and the generations before has given a world of subprime, uh, which is not the, the happiest one we are realizing. But the new generations to come is very, uh, is very positive. It, it, it's a big, big bunch of leaders willing for to give back and, and to be engaged. At the level of the company, I am of the belief that if you're profitable, a part of your, a percentage of your profit has to be given back as an individual. And, and this is what we created with the High Winston Hope Foundation. Uh, we committed the equivalent of 5% of the pre-tax profit for education around the world through gifting, through money giving, through all sorts of giving, uh, but to give back. And I think this is what all, all corporations should do. And I dream of, of, of something where we would create also a, a leading point and, and, and source of inspiration for the industry of luxury so that uh, a percentage of the profit generated should be given back. And all, if all corporations were to stand up and do the same thing, I think there yeah, would be so much more infused into the, 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 the poorest, the world of the poorest. Well, it would be a better place. Yep. Uh, Stuart, in an Indian quoted company, there's also room for... Uh, absolutely, it's fundamentally integrated in the organization and should be. For example, um, we sponsor 10 schools in rurally deprived areas in India, um, where for children who otherwise wouldn't get education at all, and the selection of those children to go to the school is nothing to do with our company, it's to do with the people who are, live and work in those communities. We also sponsor two universities on a similar basis. Um, but philanthropy, our chairman has said on one occasion that he's slightly um, not too excited by the philanthropists in the form of people like Bill Gates, because his view is that if you're a billionaire, it's easy to be a philanthropist. But if you're working from your wage of your weekly or monthly salary in an organization, giving a small proportion of that, particularly time, but also some money, is much more a demonstration of philanthropy and we have an employee council um, run by the employees and funded to the company. The funds are run by the employees in the uh, council for philanthropy, not by the company. I think I see two other questions. Um, gentleman over there, you, you raised your hand first. Uh, yes, Baudouin Roger, I'm priest of Paris and uh, I'm working in the Collège de Berdelin in a research department dealing with economy in the firm. My question is uh, about the objective of the firm uh, with creating shareholder value, which has been mentioned. And this uh, objective is often considered as 
primary for the firm and how can you reconciliate this with the idea of common good? Well, that is, uh, I suppose, the question <laughs> of, uh, of the sessions. Well, Sorry, I, go I, ahead. Thank you for answering that question. It's a fantastic question. So in our company, we, you know we've said employees first, customers second, shareholders third. And it's on the belief that in a services company, if the employees are en enthused, encouraged to deliver value, the customers will see the value. We measure it, as I've already said. By definition, the shareholders will, should become happy. One of the commitments we've made in our company to make sure shareholders do not have a, a primacy over all other aspects is you will never hear a forward-looking statement from HCL. It's a $5 billion quoted organization that will never, ever give a forward-looking statement. Frédéric, you, 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 want, you want to... You, you no, also, I think uh, exactly the same thing. I mean, our mission, delivering value to the shareholders is what is required. Uh, and and it has it, it should be uh, it should be at the center. It should not not necessarily at, at the first uh, position, but at the center. And it, it is I, I totally share with Stuart that if you create um, a, a positive environment that is a balanced environment that is a meaningful environment, the employees will deliver the promise. Will be with the engagement and commitment of the employees, you deliver a promise and you deliver a result that it will, that will be superior to your competitors, and that is sufficient to bring the value to the shareholders. Uh, but um, yeah. Uh, well, I think we have just one time for, if we want to uh, stick to Swiss time, uh, time for one last question. Yeah. Yeah. Christian Felber again from the movement of, for the economy for the common good of Austria. I didn't mention this before. Um, my question is more or less the same. And I listened to Mr. Bobst that you said that uh, belief and business must not be separated. And Mr. Denar said that um, the Holy Spirit is the guide for your daily decisions. And my question is, how can we bring together belief and business? And how can we bring together the values, the holy values and business? And uh, if those values and the fulfilling of those values and the creation of the common good and of life quality is the objective, the goal of a company, my proposal is that we should measure uh, the contribution of a company to these values and to these goals. And in our movement, we are doing this with the common good balance sheet. And the common good balance sheet is the main success indicator of a company. And that's not all. The second step is that this balance sheet is compulsory for all companies. And those companies who contribute more to the common good, who have more human working conditions, more participation, less con um, share to the shareholder values and more for ecology, they get a differential treatment. This means they pay less taxes, they get lower tariffs, they get priority in public procurement, and in the end, the more just and ethical and ecological mm -hmm. products are cheaper to consumers than the less just and less uh, ecological product. Yeah. What's your opinion to measuring compulsorily a contribution of companies to the common good and then to, to, to imply, apply a differential legal treatment to companies alongside their contribution to the common good. Thank you. The, the bells are ringing that we're running over time, but uh, that won't uh, <laughs> prevent you from not answering uh, uh, this, this question. Uh, can you actually measure uh, your contribution to the common good? Uh, does it make sense? Uh, I'm not sure I'm very good in KPIs because you can identify billions of KPIs, and I'm not a fan of KPIs because then you create more monster uh, to measure, measure, measure what? And I love the answer earlier. You just look at your people, you walk around in the company, you meet people and you see if they are happy or not, or if you have a problem. First. Second, uh, I insist very much that belief, our Christian values and business is not a part and is, is part of the same life. I mean, as I'm sharing that with you, but I'm, because it's not because I'm here without a tie, I'm talking like that, I will talk the same maybe with some more or less words in testimony, how I live my, or, 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 or run my journey with God when I'm a, with a chairman or when, when I'm uh, with a customer. But very often people are coming back and say, Jean Pascal, how can it be that for the last few years almost you went through this crisis, this crisis, this crisis? For the last three years, every year we have a crisis. 
and you are still here happy and well balanced. Uh, and this is a KPI. And because of the Holy Spirit helps me to wake up every morning with a passion for God. That's it. Now, I respect every other views and way of doing business, but at the end of the day, you look at two numbers. You, like it, you look at your market share, customer satisfaction, of course, and the net result. Because if you don't have cash, you cannot run the business, you cannot reinvest. And as a consequence, yes, we do reinvest 6-7% of the turnover in R&D innovation. We invest uh, in training. We have apprenticeship, more than 350 apprentices in Switzerland. It's more than 15% of our headcount in Switzerland, the biggest apprenticeship in Switzerland. And we know only 20%, 30% of these people will remain with us. But it's, it's a social responsibility. And with these guys, with these young people between 60s and 20 years old, we can share values. We can show them how we behave, how we culture, and so on and so on. So we, knew, we, we should really put in the daily business, in the daily commitment, in the daily speech, uh, these values and respect and love for people. Frédéric, uh, quickly before we really uh, wrap up. How, how to reconcile your belief and, and a positive and, and, and profitable business, I think it's very simple. Just implement what the church is telling you. And there is a, a cardinal was saying uh, the social doctrine of the church, which is, uh, he was saying from Africa that this is the best kept secret treasure of the Vatican. But the social, I mean, the social doctrine of the church, if you really implement subsidiarity, what everything that the church tells you, uh, very articulately, uh, if you implement subsidiarity, the sense of authority, obedience, and if you have at the end of the day your employees really understanding that they are really in charge of the creation inside your company and they are responsible and you are here to, to make them um, accountable, accountability is very important, then, then you have a positive business model and, and it's really implementing in the best management courses you, you have. I mean, most of it is inspired, I believe, from the social, social doctrine mm -hmm. of the church, even if they don't know. Well, thank you very much for this uh, last word. I, I think uh, I want to, to thank uh, Father Dermot, Stuart Drew, Frédéric Donarp, and Jean-Pascal Bobs. And I want to, to thank you for, you, you managed to be both inspiring and I think also very practical and, and concrete. And, uh, and good luck. Thank you very much.